Thank you everyone for joining us here. Um, I'm Nita. I work on outreach and communications at Hasbeek. Uh, before we get started and I hand it over to Sonali, who is our moderator today, I'm just going to briefly give some context for this panel discussion um, and some introduction of uh, RootConf, Privacy Mode, and Hasbeek. Um, so on 28 April, the Indian Computer Emergency Response Team issued new directions for information security practice and procedure and the prevention reporting and response to cyber incidents. On 4th May, um, in the RootConf Telegram group, um, we discussed the key concerns in implementing these directives from the perspective of business operations and also privacy. Um, this is a follow-up on that conversation to build on how the industry can engage with this, uh, with this intervention um, and others in the future to provide meaningful feedback. Uh, RootConf uh, started as an annual conference for practitioners from DevOps uh, and now SRE to share approaches to solve infrastructure related challenges. It has now diverged into a continuous community engagement program with focus on data security, cloud ops, data ops, and more. Privacy Mode is a growing community on data privacy with a focus on engagement with policy and improving the overall privacy ecosystem from consumer and maker standpoints. You can find the work we've done so far under hasgeek.com slash privacy mode. Uh, please take a look at our topic map, which is published at the end of the page. Uh, RootConf and privacy mode are hosted by hasgeek.com, a platform for collaborations across practices um, surrounding technology including design, law, policy, systems, and data. We collaborate through user-generated content with the aim to enable discovery and elevation of ideas and in individuals. Hasgeek.com and the Hasgeek Media Division provide the underlying infrastructure, tools, and services to facilitate these collaborations. Um, thanks to our partner, Force United Foundation, for supporting us through this event. Force United Foundation has monthly meetups in Bangalore, you can keep up with these meetings and participate on their Telegram channel. The links to all the pages and Telegram groups I've mentioned will be shared on the chat um, on Zoom and YouTube. And um, okay, that's it. I am now going to hand it over to Sonali, um, who is an associate at 9.9 .9 Insights, strategic advisor of Albright Stonebridge Group, and will be moderating this discussion. Um, before we get started, please note, uh, you can leave your questions in the chat box um, on Zoom or on YouTube. We do have a dedicated uh, time slot for Q&A, during which uh, participants on Zoom can use the raise hand feature uh, to get our attention, and then you can ask your questions. Over to you, Sonali. Hi, thanks, Nita. Um, good evening, everyone. So like Nita already mentioned, over the course of next hour or so, we'll be discussing the certain guidelines. Um, these guidelines were released in April 20, on April 28th, and they're aimed at enhancing the cyber incident reporting and security practices. Um, this session will primarily focusing on, focus on understanding two aspects. The impact that these directives have on privacy and business operations today, and the potential methods for stakeholder engagement to allay concerns. The latter would, of course, not only focus on certain guidelines per se, but we'll also sort of look at the other emerging regulations and how we can approach stakeholder engagement for tech regulations at large. Um, our panelists for the session include Mr. Srinivas Kodali, an independent researcher, Ms. Uh, Richa Mukherjee, the Director of Public Policy and Corporate Affairs at PayU India, and uh, Mr. Prateek Vaghri, the Policy Director at the Internet India Foundation. Um, welcome all. So before we delve specifically into the certain directives, it is important to note that these guidelines, of course, do not emerge in a vacuum, right? So they've been released in the backdrop of a regulatory revamp of sorts of the tech ecosystem with the draft data protection bill, a non-personal data framework, a data governance policy, a potential amendment to the IT Act, all being deliberated simultaneously. Um, the IT rules 2021, and of course, the various draft policies released in the past year or two cumulatively indicate a trend towards increasing compliance burdens for business entities. These, of course, um, are likely to raise costs and operational challenges. Um, the certain 2022 guidelines in that sense adds to the slew of such onerous regulations, right? So this is, of course, this is not the first time that certain has issued um, cybersecurity directives. Um, we know that the 2013 IT rules that mandated data storage and reporting requirements for cybersecurity those guidelines can be seen as somewhat being the precursor of the 2022 directions. 
certain also issues advisories from time to time and it's 2021 advisory on preventing data breaches and data leaks also discuss similar issues. However, the concern with this specific 2022 directive is that the proposed compliance is more onerous compared to not only the previous guidelines, but also um, the global best practices. It introduces requirements like reporting cyber incidents within six hours of becoming aware. Sorry, um, I think I got dropped there for a minute. Um, so yeah, like I was saying, um, the certain 2022 guidelines um, introduce compliance requirements. Some of them um, include things like having to report cyber incidents within six hours of becoming aware. What is reportable incident has again been expanded broadly to include things like uh, unauthorized access to social media accounts. There are time synchronization requirements. Um, entities are also mandated to designate a point of contact to sort of interface with, the, with certain um, they have to maintain logs of ICT systems for a rolling period of 180 days. And there are many other such requirements, right? These are only some of, some of them. And while we will be discussing the specific implications of these requirements as we progress with our uh, session this evening, it is worth noting that the industry has already um, like been responding to these directions and most of them have conceived them as being cumbersome and unclear. And most of them have also flagged concerns around issues like heightened compliance costs, questionable implementability scope, especially given how these directions sit with global data privacy um, laws like GDPR, and also the potential privacy implications um, of this direction in itself. While we understand that some of these ambiguities have been clarified by the FAQs released earlier this week, during the course of the next 50-55 um, minutes or so, our panelists will discuss the challenges and questions that businesses face if these directions were to be implemented as is. Um, the Minister of State, Rajiv Chandrasekhar, has, of course, um, publicly stated that compliance is mandatory and entities unable to comply should not operate in India. He's also claimed that these directives are less stringent than many other jurisdictions and that the requirement are imperative for ensuring cybersecurity. Um, in this slide, I think we will also discuss, of course, mechanisms that stakeholders can opt to uh, engage with, st uh, with stakeholders, government, um, for this directive, but also for the slew of other um, tech regulations coming up. We, explore op we will be exploring options like scope for building coalitions, having consultations, and legally challenging directives, if at all possible, since that's also something um, entities, stakeholders have talked about. So I would now um, hand it over to Mr. Kodali, uh, and I would also request uh, Mr. Kodali to sort of, if you could just highlight the technical challenges, particularly that entities might face in implementing these guidelines, especially with requirements, you know, such as time synchronization, reporting time frames, log maintenance. Over to you. Hi. So I think uh, the challenge to businesses primarily implementing some of these guidelines is resources. Uh, what CERT is asking them to do is constantly log every action of everyone accessing any of their infrastructure, whether it is a uh, legal access or illegal access, you don't know, right? Like uh, if you are maintaining a service which is open for everyone, you don't know who is actually accessing your services. Uh, I'm not saying that there are certain operations that are uh, regulated. There are some, some operations which are unregulated. You really don't know. It's it, it depends on the business and the kind of sector the business is in, where uh, these businesses tend to store some data for their own internal requirements or tend not to store any data when where they are offering it as a service. Right. So uh, both direction four and direction five of the cert uh, directions. Direction four says everything needs to be logged for 180 days. And that includes SSH access logs. Uh, it includes, uh, if you're a cloud service provider, I'm assuming here because these directions are never clear, even the sort uh, 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 clarifications of the directions are not clear enough. But if you are a cloud service provider, uh, everything that your client does, you're pretty much required to log, right? Now that could be uh, HTTP access logs, H uh, SSH logs, and there are also error logs and whatnot. So pretty much everything needs to be logged for 180 days. Now, 
the volume of these logs can get pretty high depending upon how big your business is and storing customer logs who are temporary customers who may be using your cloud services for just a day or just few hours for uh, a size of say AWS or even Microsoft Azure could be so high that storing data for 180 days could incur significant uh, costs on electricity for no reason. Right, and it's important to understand here why they are saying 180 days. Uh, 180 days is again a standard legal requirement when you look at the telecom sector for storing call data records, or if you even look at the other judgment and the storage of metadata with other transactions, it's limited to 180. Uh, it's an assumed standard in India, so that's the reason they're saying 180 days, a bare minimum of six months. Now, for the industry, it's not. Uh, issue of technical requirements, it's an issue of uh, the cost of storage and operations, right? Uh, that will be the primary problem here. Now, the man hours will go up for compliance, and I, I believe that's the reason they are opposing it primarily. But if you look at uh, Regulation 5, which is for VPN service providers, that kills anonymity for good. Now, while CERT clarifying these directions has said that direction five is only for VPN service providers and not for company corporate VPNs, right? But direction four still applies where cloud service providers who may be offering to individuals uh, to allow to set up their own VPNs. Like anybody can set up an open VPN if you have a server. You're still required to log all of the transactions that are happening and you're required to give it to cert, except the time period is less compared to direction five. Now, apart from this, the most, uh, the first direction of time synchronization, I think if you look at global standards, right? Like uh, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Testing in US actually offers a host of uh, time servers. Like anyone can uh, point their machines time servers to NIST NTP servers. Now that's optional. The issue here is the mandatory nature of it, saying that, look, we need to ensure that any cybercrime incident needs to be responded by CERT. So we want everyone to sync to Indian time zones. Now, the difficulty in doing this is that if you are a, um, if you are a multinational firm where you're trying to synchronize your times within your corporate networks, uh, it could be challenging to sync it only with the Indian network servers, right? The NTP servers that CERT and India is providing. Uh, it would be near impossible unless you isolate it and have your own internal network for India only. Uh, if corporates and like business structures have already done this, great. Uh, but if you have to move away to something like this, it could be again resource intensive. And it is something that companies may not be looking forward to do so. Like uh, if say even some certain cloud service providers like Google Cloud or Azure or even AWS have to do this, particularly for India, I think they have to change and change their entire business operation mechanisms for India specific only. Now, for smaller firms, this could be a challenge where doing all of this is so hard that they'll just quit. And government of India is saying, why don't you do that? Like, we don't really care if you're so small. And uh, for the big businesses, they are going to force them to comply somehow. And we, are, we have to wait and watch where this is going to go. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Godali. Um, I would not, we'll of course discuss this in more detail and bring in some questions after we're through with the introductory remarks. But um, I would now like to bring in Richard which if you could just highlight a little about how PayU and its peers are thinking about sort of complying with these guidelines. And, uh, you know, given a 60 day timeline, the minister is saying that it's adequate time. You only have to comply with the reporting requirement in 60 days. And there's no real resource that you have to build or infrastructure that you have to institute to sort of get this going. So um, as PayU, what are some of the key challenges that you are envisioning? Um, how do they compare with prior regulations? Uh, and um, do you think you'd be able to comply within the stipulated time? 
Sure. Thanks, Sonali, for setting the context, and thanks, Haski, for having me in this uh, discussion. Very pertinent, very uh, important that we are having this discussion today. First of all, I would want to start with certain cert ins endeavor to bolster the cybersecurity, uh, you know, ecosystem in India. I mean, I've been interacting with certain for last so many years, and uh, they've been really instrumental along with the National Cybersecurity Coordinator's Office, etc. So these guidelines have come. I mean, and they also have a history of why they have brought in these kind of uh, guidelines because there were certain segments which were not directly uh, accountable to certain because uh, they said uh, they said the customers are uh, are the ones who are directly responsible for certain but nevertheless let me just start by what these directions are and how it's going to impact the fintech ecosystem since i represent the fintech uh, so let me just broadly talk about the fintech and ecosystem so the guidelines as they came out on april 28th have a stringent uh, applicability of within two months so that leaves us with about 40 days time to implement and just now only we have uh, started to have discussions internally within within payu or within any organizations because so i would say um with all the guide uh, with all the circular even though certain is not a regulator or certain is not a regulatory body it is still has its role as a quasi regulatory body just like npci is and all the guidelines that they have laid out, if they are implemented in the current form, they will have wide ranging unanticipated impact on the internet ecosystem in India. While I do understand the well intentions of the certain, but I, I really feel, I see that it can dramatically increase the administrative burden, both for the industry as well as for certain. Like, uh, as I will just uh, talk about in my subsequent things that how it's going to um, you know increase the burden for certain as well. While the guidelines, it covers just about anybody who is connected to internet, whether it is a service provider, corporates, companies having data centers, cloud service provider, government organizations, and even the foreign companies which serve Indian customers. So my first question was whether my, my organization is covered under this. So I'm assuming it is because we are the so service provider in whichever form and so so for us for the fintech ecosystem there are uh, sonali broadly four three to four points i would want to highlight i'll just call them out and also uh talk about the justification not the justification sorry the challenge that it might have for the ecosystem so first and foremost is the report incidents within the six hours uh, that any entity has to report report the cybersecurity incident of or within six hours of noticing uh, the incident. This can be done via email, fax, phone, et cetera, as per an extra one. That is what the guideline says. Now here I want to emphasize that while the initial view of the incident or the notification can be reported within six hours, but detailed RCA will of course require tough time in hand. Uh, there have also been talks in the industry that why the six hours is uh, being stipulated because normal the global standards as they say is about 48 to 72 hours and I think uh, we were till this point of time we were going in by that time time frame of uh, within three days within 72 hours of uh, coming to notice so six hours looks like stringent one. And also, uh, sometimes what happens is if, it's, if it is a very sophisticated ransomware, uh, you just spot it, but you cannot report it immediately because you do not know how it will manifest. So six, uh, six hours, I would say, is a very short window to actually understand that what sort of a um, heist or ransomware or malware has impacted you. So it takes uh, sometimes I already I, I would say most of the time it will take more than stipulated six hours. That is number one. Uh, number two is um, the circular guidelines. It practically covers all the incidents that could possibly happen, which which needs to be reported. So uh, it is as simple as a spam notification, which any individual gets like about so many of them, at least. I would say 50, 60 also sometimes if we look at our uh, email. So that I don't see any point reporting those because that will just, uh, you know, create the logs and logs of it. And of what I was discussing within the PayU and within the industry is that we need to really define the severity methodology, wherein only the most severe of the um, most severe of the transactions or whatsoever, they are reported within the timelines defined. 
Uh, third is uh, about the crypto exchanges and wallets. Crypto exchanges and wallets, since we are also operate of wallets, so the KYC details have to be kept for five years. Uh, it's kind of most of the industry is doing at the moment, but still there are some. Um, this is not that much of a concern because you know some of the uh, deadlines which are mentioned here or the, the timelines that are mentioned here, that is still covered by the sectoral regulator. Uh, I don't remember what is it for wallet, but that is still not that much of a stringent one. Um, also, I think we want to understand that when certain says that we have to report all kinds of transactions and they have laid out the list of these other things that we have to report it, what is the certain going to do with those transactions or uh, with those kind of reportings? What will be the incident log look like? And what would be the audit mechanism? And, and what happens after that? So we want to, as an industry, as a fintech ecosystem player, we want to really understand that. Next is, uh, I would not dwell much on that, is on the cloud service provider, which the previous speaker, Srinivas, had, uh, you know, he covered that. I was uh, earlier working with the cloud service provider and I, really understand where these notification is coming from that all the all the data all their uh, logs they have to re be reported because it was essentially the customers thing that uh, that the certain was asking for so uh, i will skip that part uh, on the next one is the maintaining logs for 180 days in india fin all the fintechs they have to mandatorily enable logs of their ICT system. Now ICT system is what, what is that exactly that has not been elaborated upon and they have to maintain them securely for a rolling period of 180 days. So this again is kind of covered under, under the RBI guidelines. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's doable, it's challenging, but it's doable as such. Um, the next thing is a certain can order actions and demand information uh, in the real time basis. Uh, so just don't understand the, you know, what is the logic of that? Um, really, we would need that what is a certain going to what kind of uh, information they are going to demand if it's going to be real time. It's, it's going to be a challenge. Uh, my last point is on the point of contact. That's a very valid point. And I think in all my interactions with RBI supervision department and even with certain and even with NS NCSC, they have always been saying that point of contact is something each organization should have, should, should pass it on to the regulators. That essentially, you know, helps in if there is any kind of a heist or anything goes wrong, that person can be contacted and things can be done or things can be audited very well and um, incident response management can be taken care of well. Uh, so that is one thing which is a, which is a good practice, I would say. Um, should I highlight some of the concern areas now or, or shall we move to the next speaker, Sonali? Um, I think we can discuss that in more detail when we come no. around with the questions. Um, sure. I would now move on to Pratik. Pratik? You know, um, we've been hearing about these two divergent schools of thought almost about the legality of the directions. Now, um, could you shed some light on that? And of course, also elaborate on what the common perception of industry has been so far vis-a-vis -vis these guidelines. Okay, so uh, let me first point out that I am not a lawyer, right? So you should not take uh, uh, take it from 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 that uh, from that perspective. I do want to highlight some of the broader concerns that. That you know that we as IFF had with these uh, with these directions uh, when they came up, right? The first was uh, the whole the, the fact that these came around without uh, any sort of public consultation, right? I think, and this is this is a general trend. It's not it's not restricted uh, to these. Uh, and you know, uh, we, we also had the Minister of State statement uh, saying that uh, this is not required uh, you know, because it doesn't affect the arm admin. And I think we differ with that uh, with that because it, it may not be directed. Uh, okay, my video is frozen. Can you still see? Hear me? Okay. No, yeah. So, so, so yeah. So, so you know, we, 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 we can have a line in the FAQ saying that this is not meant for individual uh, individuals, but it does affect individual users, right? And that's where our, uh, a, a, a large concern for us uh, comes from. Uh, the other one was about uh, ambiguity in you know with in scope and in the phrasing of the direction, right? and I think both both Shinivas and Richard have pointed out some of the things uh, that were ambiguous that that seemed like they were hard to interpret. Uh, yes, there is an FAQ that has been uh, released. I think officially, finally. Uh, but even even with that, there are there are still you know a, a lot of question marks 
uh, it's in terms of the NTP uh, synchronization. They've said, okay, you don't have to synchronize with IST, uh, but you don't, but you have to still ensure that there is no deviation. Uh, how does that work? Right? These are these are these are complex processes. Right? These are things that would have ideally come out uh, in an open consultation uh, uh, kind of process. Uh, the other concern area is around. Uh, you know, penal provisions, right? Which is and, and this ties back to to ambiguity, right? So when you have a set of directions that have a lot of uh, you know ambiguity, and people are generally unsure of what applies to them, what doesn't apply to them, how to uh, you know how to respond. Uh, then when you add uh, penal provisions in there, which includes, which can include a prison term as well. Uh, in in this case, based on the section of the IT Act that they've uh, that they've referred to, uh, that's also a, a huge huge area of concern. Right, um, and of course, you know the 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 final point is again, again and this is again not restricted to a certain direction that's happening with 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 most uh, regulation that's coming out right now is that they're all happening in the absence of a data protection bill, right? Uh, from and so from an from an individual user perspective, from a privacy perspective, uh, that's certainly an area of concern as well. Thanks, thanks, Riti. Just to follow on for what you uh, what mentioned right now, you know. The government had said we did have closed door consultations um, and we didn't make it available for public consultations. The reason being that it's not something that impacts citizens per se. Now, uh, one, from what we understand, there were only like three to four companies who were invited to this closed door conversation, uh, consultation. However, in your experience, not only these certain guidelines, but you know, other regulations also, what would an ideal process be like? We've seen in DPB, there have been iterations of the draft itself, but there've also been like series of stakeholder consultations, right? We saw there were a bunch of actual depositions before the joint committee. There were, ministry was, METI was officially open for uh, comments. Now we know that the ministry, METI has since about de uh, December, January has been receiving informal uh, submissions. So um, what would ideal, ideally the situation, uh, how should it be like? Sure. So, you know, so, so there's no single good answer for that, right? But ha having said that, uh, I think look, look, look it, it's understandable for someone to start with, uh, you know, with uh, with a smaller group for uh, for the initial consultation to just to frame and have something in place. Uh, but I think then, you know, with with that as a working example, that that's when you open it out for uh, for public consultation to to get feedback, right? Uh, and you know, it, it's it's easy to interpret public consultation not only as you know, not only as members of the public, but even companies that haven't had the opportunity to you know provide feedback into the process would have come would have done so via a public consultation process right so it's again it's not aam right it's also uh, it's also the companies that would have uh, that, that that would have uh, come in right so ideally you you know you do want to open it up for public consultation there is a pre legislative consulting policy that's in place yes you can say that this is not really uh, uh, you know uh, legislation from that perspective but it that has certain uh, guidelines that, uh, or your principles that that you can adhere to in terms of providing people uh, enough time to respond, right? Uh, then being transparent with the with, with the responses that you get, right? Posting that again, that's a, that's a practice that we've seen uh, is not is not really being uh, being followed, right? Uh, even uh, they also cite that sometimes this, the the responses themselves are are confidential and things like that, right? To a uh, to a public consultation process, so you need to be transparent about uh, about things like that, right? Uh, and you know, it it then working through that through that incrementally. Of course, the flip side is it it can also turn out sometimes the way the some of the consultation for the data protection bill has, where it's gone protected and it's gone uh, across multiple years, uh, and we're still not sure when that bill uh, you know will actually be passed. Uh, but you know, it's it's about finding that uh, that middle ground in, in in between them. But certainly coming out without. Uh, certainly, coming out without any sort of uh, uh, public consultation uh, is is definitely not the right way to do it. That that makes a lot of sense. Actually, following on from that, Richa, you know, as a member of the industry who was not invited to the consultation, um, have hasn't like have industry stakeholders actually been in the process of developing a submission? Have co are coalitions being made? Um, we know that some industry associations are planning to submit um, comments on the uh, on the guidelines but given how short the timelines are and given how it's supposed to come into force in about a week's time 
how what what is the scope to engage also after the comments that uh, minister chandrashekhar has made recently so uh, definitely in this industry consultation and industry submission is a must and what i'm seeing is most of the uh, chambers and the associations they are getting ready to make the submission and we are also in the process of uh, sending our submission via the associations so i think uh, as a as a part of fintech ecosystem all the possible association whether it is ima ishm nascom india tech dsci we are all going to give our submissions we are all going to raise our concerns and challenges with this kind of guidelines and so that is the first step and and, and then there of course there are certain uh, organizations which are deeply impacted by this uh, they can also think of having a direct engagement uh, with the certain as such that that makes sense yeah um thanks so shrinivas you know there has been one of the most um, i think a clause which has attracted the most media attention is the 6 hr reporting requirement right now um industry has said that you know look at jurisdictions like us singapore which have these 3 day 72 hr time frames but the minister has come back and said you know why don't you look at indonesia which has a 1 hr reporting requirement or france which is a 4 hr reporting requirement so i think the question is now not about who does what i think it's about what is technologically viable and to um what is absolutely essential for mitigating any potential risks so from a technical perspective like how how are you thinking about it do you think it's actually possible to uh, implement that 6 hr timeline see uh, i think it's definitely feasible if you are a large organization which has the three sh shift staff which is doing your 8 hour 8 hour shift 24 hours but if you're a small organization where you're letting your devops team go to sleep and you suddenly have some hacker in the us attacking you at 1 am in the night i don't think he can report to you by 7 am in the morning <laughs> okay well so it's 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 a question of operations and how big you are now i think the minister statement is actually directed against large players okay and large players are usually the ones who are who have not been compliant and when i say large players also multinationals platforms who have kind of ignored the indian regulatory setup for a really long time now whether it's 6 hours 24 hours or 72 hours uh, the matter of fact is what will certain do with it okay so for a long for a longer time the cyber security community has been actually reporting incident to cert hoping it will actually respond to an emergency okay it never does and like as someone who has sent some of these instant reports i know the reply time period can range from few hours to few months unless you send in a journalist to cert saying look i've sent this important emergency incident uh, vulnerability report to cert but they haven't reacted to it and suddenly one day a journalist goes for a quote and they realize oh we're going to fix it i mean so the way cert operates they are not equipped for it uh, the entire cyber security industry is kind of self regulated cert kind of empanels a host of cyber security organizations who then go provide services to a lot of these companies cert as an organization is not equipped to handle these emergencies i believe they are trying to do that now there's a lot of pressure on them to address a lot of cyber uh, fraud incidents especially fintech related fraud if you are if you have seen the kind of aps fraud that's happening people losing money social engineering there is a host of uh, host of cyber security incidents that are happening also we have become an increasingly digital society with covid everyone went online now there is indeed pressure on government of india to do something about it but the way they are trying to respond to it is something that may not yield in anything good what you might eventually end up with is a lot of noise with every minor incident being reported to them and they don't know what to do with it no that makes sense and also you know when we are thinking about this um six hr reporting requirement um something that's also worth thinking about is what is it that we have to report within those six hours right because if if sure it's a bigger attack that we are talking about then it might make sense however we know that the list of uh, reporting reportable incidents is almost doubled from 10 to 20 now 
And, you know, um, Richa previously talked about how something like a spam email, like how do you report that and how frequently do you report that because of the high frequency of such incidents. Um, and then globally, another thing that's been talked about is unauthorized access to social media accounts. You know, sometimes entities might not have the visibility of uh, such incidents. So how do you tackle with those cases? So does it then become only a small company issue or can like, you know, say a bigger entity, bigger social media firms, the Facebooks and Twitters of the world, can they also not implement these in the letter of spirit, letter and spirit of the directives? See, the, I believe uh, what they're trying to do is actually prepare for a cyber warfare kind of scenario. But right now, if there is actually a cyber war on India, CERT would never know it. It would be companies and all these people who get affected by it, like our who actually get affected by it, they would know it, right? Now, there are no systems in place for CERT to actually understand what's happening over the cyberspace. It has never, in the last decade of its existence, since 2008, when CERT was formed out of the IT Act amendments, uh, we really don't know what they have done, right? If you actually go and look at their annual reports, you will have a bunch of numbers. So many incidents have occurred, but we don't know what they're doing about it. And I think there was a news report today that they're going to make a, a cert, like not to reply to any RTIs, exempt from RTIs, okay? So what you're doing now is you're trying to prepare a, a national security apparatus which will potentially actually respond to cyber warfare scenarios. But to do that, they're saying every other entity needs to prepare for emergencies. And I'll only ask you these logs when there is an actual emergency. So to know there is an actual emergency, you will have to consistently reply, respond to every single incident. So if there are a parallel set of instances, there are probably 100 instances of particular kind, they know there is something big going on. So CERT is not making this part clear. It is, uh, I mean, for anyone who has followed CERT for a longer time and the government, in, government of India's policies, it is very clear they're trying to ramp up infrastructure, but they can work with the Indian cybersecurity community and even the Indian corporates to do it the right way. What they are doing is not actually going to help them, right? So, uh, which is why it's important to ask some of these questions and bring some accountability on them. Because even if there is a cyber war, they don't want to be accountable and they don't want to tell you what went with it. Understood. You know, and. Um... Having a national security apparatus sure sounds good and uh, maybe it's need of the hour as well. But Pratik, I'd like you to come in here. And, you know, because the timing of these guidelines is very interesting to me. So I'm thinking there is a data protection bill that's been in the works for very long. Um, there are severe privacy related risks um, with this direction as well that emerge from these directives. For example, DPB talks about data minimization, but this is anything but that, right? You're talking about 180 days worth of logs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, also, it contradicts with some of the provisions from the, uh, the data protection bill. It talks about DP, uh, the DPB, for example, it talks about reporting a breach within 72 hours to the data protection authority. This has a very different provision for the same thing. So um, do you think they should perhaps have waited for uh, the data protection bill to kick in and then sort of brought in these guidelines. You're also talking about the IT Act amendment that might also have been another avenue through, these, through which some of these could have been brought in. So is timing something that is making sense to you or um, how do you see all of these parallel? You know, that, that's an interesting question and, and a tricky one, right? Because in the sense that, uh, look, the 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 issue of, you know, let's say the reporting to DPA versus to the certain, the, they're essentially two different authorities. So theoretically, yes, you can have different timelines of, uh, of reporting to, to each of them, right? Uh, that in itself is, is, is probably okay. Now there have been, you know, I think we've spoken enough about the duration of the timeline and potential for gradation of different types of attacks, et cetera, uh, that, that you should report at. Uh, but I, I think what, again, what's important here was, you know, as, as Shinwa just pointed out, right? That in terms of process, this should have happened 
uh, the right way, right? It it could have happened in yes, you know, you could have done it before you overhaul the IT Act. You could have done it after you overhaul the IT Act. Obviously, the government saw some pressing need uh, to 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 do this to do this now, uh, and you know that that that's I guess okay. But it again goes back to the to the method, right? Of 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 doing this uh, that instead of taking uh, you know the industry into account, instead of uh, taking do, going to a broader consultation process. Uh, it's been pushed out like a diktat, right? And I think that's that's where uh, the the fundamental issue is. That that makes sense. Um, now we have questions coming in from the YouTube live stream. Someone's asking: uh, Are companies allowed to disclose to their users that their data was sent to certain and the reasoning and for why? Which are um, what is your understanding on this? Do you think um, someone like a page? you will have to disclose to his customers if the data was sent to certain. So uh, it, it really depends. Um, uh, ideally, um, not just pay you. In my past experiences in various organizations, uh, suppose if any government and not government, the law enforcement entity seeks the customer data, until unless it's a terrorist relating thing, terrorist related thing, we normally inform the customer that your your data is being shared. So I think that is the stand that uh, the organizations are going to take. Uh, but I think we don't have any clarity in these uh, guidelines. It also depends on the company's policies. But this is what I'm assuming that uh, the organizations will have to report to the customers that your data is being shared. Yeah. Also, there's another question on. Um, sorry, Shrinivas has something to say. Yeah, but so I just just want to add, like I think there were a couple of statements which were made by some insiders. Uh, they were saying that look, all this logging that we are asking you to do, we, uh, even though the directions actually say we want real time data, but they're like we only need it when there is an incident. So when there is an incident, we are going to get a court order or issue directions under section 69 of the IT Act. Section 69 of the IT Act allows a set of government agencies to decrypt uh, any encrypted information and intercept information essentially, right? It, it's a very national security provision. Now, if you are being issued a section 99, uh, order under section 99 of the uh, 69 of the IT Act, I don't believe you can disclose them to your consumers. Uh, again, a lawyer could be a, uh, could give yeah. you a better opinion, yeah, but so we haven't seen any section 69 orders. Uh, it, I believe uh, the first kind of censorship orders that we are seeing is through IFF's one of the cases, and these are encryption decryption related orders which they don't want to ever disclose. So it's very unlikely to see them. That's that's quite interesting. Um, so in that case, users will be oblivious to the fact that their data has been shared by with certain or not. Um, also, there, someone's asking if there is going to be a transparent process and reporting on how this data is requested, used or stored by certain, like, do we have, and you know, with, um, Srinivas, what you mentioned earlier about um, certain being excluded from the ambit of RTI, that might again be a question to look at, but um, any idea about how transparent this process would be? I mean, uh, for the past 10 years, none of the certain operations were transparent. Like, I mean, if you look at some of the major breaches that happened during the COVID period, uh, Big Basket, Mobiquik, Air India, Domino's, CERT never reacted to any of them, right? Like, so the question is, forget transparency, uh, is there any accountability on CERT? None. Uh, like, and it, it kind of extends to multiple other organizations, but we haven't seen CERT being accountable or doing anything significant unless you go to court. Right, right, that's interesting. Um, Richa, one question for you, you know, Srinivas was earlier talking about how the big versus the small company distinction and being able to comply with these guidelines, you know, as PayU, how do you see it? And um, you were talking earlier about some of the concerns that you have, that PayU specifically has with um, these guidelines. Yeah. Uh, so would love to hear more on that. 
Yeah, sure. So I think uh, some of the, there are two to three concerns that uh, I would say any fintech organization would have. First was, of course, as we have been talking about the six hours thing, that six hours is too short a window. Uh, you are not able to analyze what is a specific SLA, uh, what, how, what details you can conclude, and you definitely need to have, uh, you know, carry out uh, root cause analysis. So six hour window is definitely a concern area. Second point is, um, normally what we do in the fintech sector is with respect, so each of the, each of the organization, it defines its severity mechanism, severity methodology, uh, in terms of what they will be sharing with RBI. And this is via PCI also. So can, is it fine that the companies which have been defining severities to the cyber uh, incidents, this will be applicable and acceptable to to say certain, just like uh, we share it with RBI, uh, or what sort of incidents we are going to share. I mean, it cannot be all. I mean, it cannot be all, right? Uh, number three is um, what is expected to be reviewed and approved by the auditors expecting ban benchmark? What will be, uh, what will it be now that the audit will happen? As we say, it is all certain and paneled auditor. Uh, Public consultation, I think Srinivas had already spoken about. Uh, there was one more thing I wanted to talk about was, uh, yeah, uh, in terms of there is no clarity on the processes and the grievance redressal mechanism in place if after an incident has been reported to certain. So what will happen after that? That's the, Those are the some of the questions and the concerns that we have uh, from the FinTech perspective. Understood. And uh, what about the ease of compliance, you know, within a week's time from, from now? No, it is uh, two months, right? So April, May, June, we have 40 days, right? Yeah, sorry, uh, from, by June 28th, yeah. Yes, so that is again a challenge. I think that will have uh, some amount of cost, dedicated resources have to be um, employed for that particular thing. So of course, it has the administrative burden, compliance burden, uh, all those things are, of course, uh, into the picture now. Understood. Understood. Um, you know, since the FAQs were released earlier this week, there has been talk about the good and the bad of it. So, Prateek, if you could just shed some light on if the FAQs have been helpful at all. And uh, if so, are they exhaustive? Um, and maybe each of each of you could talk a little bit about what clarity the FAQs bring, if any at all. Yeah, sure. So uh, look, it's hard to characterize, you know, a 40 odd question document as good, good or bad. Uh, but, you know, I, I will say that, yes, on certain points, they have added uh, some clarity. But as I was saying earlier, right, a lot of questions still remain, uh, still remain open, right? And for example, with the, uh, the, the bit about the NTP synchronization, right? What does it mean to say, uh, yes, you don't have to sync it to, to IST, but you also have to ensure no deviation. Now, again, outside my area of expertise, I know timing is a very complex process, uh, but how does that work, you know, uh, et cetera, right? So, so there are uh, there are still a lot of uh, questions that, that remain unanswered. I'm struggling to remember, to, to recall one uh, at, at this point, one that, that still left, uh, you know, left me asking more questions, but you know, on the balance of it, some of them added some clarity, uh, but we have, you know, we're far away from uh, having complete clarity. And then there's also the point that took the an FAQ, the supporting document. It's not, it's not a legal document by itself. It has no standing uh, as such, right? So yes, it can, it can add some clarity, but it's, ultimately it's the directions themselves and the wording of the directions that, that really matters, right? And I think, and, and that's where most of the challenges are. Understood. Um, Srinivas, thoughts? Okay. Uh, see, I, I, I'm one of those people who was actually asking Sir to do something because when when there were these large scale data breaches, we actually wrote to Sir saying, "Why are you not investigating this?" Right now, suddenly Sir is like, "Oh, I've woken up. I'm going to investigate everything." You, you you're looking at two ends of the spectrum, right? And neither are good. Now, how, how can people oppose this? What do we do with this? I think uh, a lot of companies are going to oppose this. Uh, Rich has already made it clear. There are 
associations which are trying to send some responses. Uh, but whatever you do as a citizen at this stage, unless you're going to courts or unless you're actually going to show up in front of MITE's office, uh, I don't think they care because the last time we sent uh, them uh, letters asking to take some action, at least tell us if there was a breach, do some audit, uh, they didn't respond at all. And then when we send them a legal notice, uh, the official in charge, uh, CERT has a citizen coordinator, like they have a citizen charter and the citizen charter has a citizen coordinator who actually is supposed to reply to you for any queries that you have in 30 days. He sent a reply saying that you don't have to tell us what we have to do. Okay, when this was put in front of a judge in Delhi High Court, the judge was furious. What sort of reply is this? Okay, so they are very, uh, I, I don't know what sort of experience Richa has as a representative of a company, but uh, uh, if you're an Aam Admi, CERT really doesn't care about you. And if you're a cybersecurity researcher, I, I believe Everyone's pointing to the 2014 guidelines, but there were 2021 guidelines last year, which talks about how cybersecurity researchers can report to CERT. There is a clause where it says that, uh, you know what, even if you report us some of the security instance, it, it doesn't mean that we are not going to arrest you. Okay, so it's like, we don't care what you do. So none of the processes uh, in any of the setup have been accountable. Now, if the question is who should make CERT accountable, there is something called the Parliamentary Committee of IT. Unfortunately, the parliament's not working. So it's back to the people to pressure them saying this is going to affect us. Go to courts, shout, the max you can do is this. But businesses do have a leverage saying this is going to impact us. And I think at the end of the day, it will be what businesses say. Well, we certainly do hope so. Um, Richa, thoughts on the FAQs? Yes, so I will just allude to Srinivas's point. Uh, you know, I was interacting most with certain when I was with my erstwhile company called Swift. And um, they had to open up a joint venture and I was part of it nevertheless. So that was the time 2016 to 2017, 2015 to 2017, when most of the cyber heats were happening, not only in India, but um, outside India also, starting with the Bangladesh Bank, Central Bank, and then in India, Union Bank of India and several other banks. So that was the time when I was most interacting with certain because of the cyber heats. So it was also um, like we were informing of the whatever incident that was happening, Swift was name was there and we were uh, reporting to them, but it was also only of our own, like SWIFT came out with a cybersecurity program. So it was up to an individual organization, how they protect its consumers, how they protect its customers, because at that time, SWIFT came out with customer security program, the incident response mechanism, the five pillars, et cetera, et cetera. So that is one part. Second part, if um, whether the FAQs have helped the ecosystem or not, I don't know. I really don't have an answer to this because after I saw the guidelines and then I read through the FAQs, that does not give me much of a clarity, I would say, you know, so to speak. I have read it like twice. Um, there are still a lot of questions. There are still a lot of clarifications and uncertainties there. I think the best thing would be to have uh, multiple public consultation because one consult, one or two odd consultations would not suffice. So, I think, and for, for any healthy ruling or any directions to come out at such a scale, we need um, open consultation. So that is my take on this. That's that's a very valid point. Um, next, we have a question in our uh, chat box from Sarvesh Mati, who's asking um, and who's qualified it by saying that he knows that there's there are no lawyers here. But what are the legal grounds on which um, this directive could be challenged? Now, um, we've seen in the case of IT rules, the question of whether, how helpful um, legal challenges can be are questionable. However, um, why this is helpful, um, like the entities who are saying that, you know, section 872 ZF, because these directives have not been uh, formulated within that specific clause, that could be a potential reason. 
but um, if anyone would like to take this question and sort of respond to Satish. I have no idea, no legal background as such. Okay. Uh, I mean, Pratik was iterating this as well. No, like these directions are not like, like A, CERT is not a regulator, quasi regulator. So these are mere directions. Uh, now the penal provisions, how we don't know, like only when they issue these orders, there's a judge or judge who is ordering you to do something or there's these section 69 orders. But I don't think government of India has the powers to force you to log without a law. Like there are a host of laws. Like if you have, uh, um, we do this thing called uh, digital certification, right? Like digital signs. Uh, the office of the certification control authority makes it mandatory for all digital signature logs to be stored for seven years. Okay, even RBI has few provisions, each regulator has few provisions. Right now, these directions don't have the backing of a parent act from the way I see it. So they can't force you to start logging. Now, in terms of challenging, like you cannot comply, uh, but then, then there is always this threat of going to jail. Uh, you can challenge it. Uh, in terms of challenging, on, on the grounds, I think privacy is one of the grounds uh, of the customers, uh, but you can't challenge few parts of the directions, which is mandatory reporting. I don't think you can say that all of these directions are bad and I want all of them gone. Uh, some of them can be taken away completely, like the VPN can be taken away for good. Logging, what is likely going to happen is more clarity uh time frame uh and the costs right like that is something that the industry is going to negotiate uh they can't say no to it entirely but some level of agreement or compromise will happen but i don't think any court is going to take this away because uh if you look at the other judgment where the idea of metadata and controlling regulating metadata and allowing governments to have metadata for a period of 180 days exists uh, is going to influence any legal challenge. Now, I don't know if there is any good ground to challenge direction four. Okay. Uh, yeah, the NTP, again, uh, if you can, if you're an Indian company, I think you'll be forced to, if you are a multinational, they'll probably give you some relaxations and yeah. So it, it's not like we can challenge all of the directions, not going to happen. That's, that's very, very helpful. I think uh, we are almost done with our time, but before we close, I wanted to take quick remarks from all of you about, you know, what are the next steps? What should be the next steps in the stakeholder engagement? How should companies be thinking about it? How should uh, business entities be thinking about it? And especially in the, in the light of the fact that, you know, we discussed how certain is a very unique stakeholder in that sense. It's not, even though it's part of METI, it's not one of those usual ministries that you have to deal with. So from that perspective, um, what do you think the next steps should look like? Um, Pratik, over to you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm just going to reiterate, right? Uh, what, what A lot of what we've said is that, look, I think there needs to be a, a transparent consultation process, right? With with more industry involved, uh, with arm log who care about their arm logs also involved, right? Perfect. Uh, Shinavas? I think there needs to be a lot of pushback, uh, uh, demand for a what CERT is doing um, uh, uh, in terms of both transparency and accountability. Uh, but I think it's it's not going to happen. I'm, I'm being very realistic here. Uh, yes, companies do have some power here to negotiate, but uh, the Aam Admi might be on the road for good. Like end of the day, you are going to lose some of your, some part of your rights. Uh, but I think as, as I was saying before, certain has a citizen charter, go to certain's website if you're a citizan, uh, or any cybersecurity researcher, you don't, you're not a company, 
where you're not implementing these rules, but you're concerned with it, then I think the only way to engage with certain is through their citizen charter. Well, companies know what they have to do. Perfect. Um, Richa? Yes, so as I mentioned earlier also, I think the technical submission to certain via associations, all possible associations, uh, whichever organization one is part of, um, one should give. And I think along with the challenges and the concern one has to raise with certain, if possible, leveraging their experience, global experience or local experience, they, one can also put forward the suggestions or the global standards or the best practices as well in the submission. So that, you know, we have the holistic picture that um, what can be done right um, or what, what is the proper time frame, timelines, et cetera. So along with the concerns and challenges, I would say let's put forward some suggestions as well uh, to certain via associations. Thank you. Um, thank you, Richa, uh, Srinivas, Pratik, for your time. Uh, it's been a pleasure interacting with all of you. Uh, Nita, over to you to, for uh, closing the session. Thank you, Sonali.